Recorded live. Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to the Castle of Horror uh, podcast, the show dedicated to horror movies and awesomeness. Uh, this week, we reached the penultimate uh, film in our Evil Dead retrospective with Army of Darkness, which ends the Raimi Campbell trilogy. And um, just bear in mind, if you haven't seen today's movie, we're going to be talking about it from the perspective of horror fans who have, so there are spoilers ahead. Um, this is Tony Salvaggio, uh, lead singer of the band Desert to Mars, and uh, also with Jason, who isn't here, I do uh, a comic book called Clockworks from Humanoids, and Psycom from Tokyo Pop. Also is in Austin is uh, Drew Edwards, writer of the long-running comic Halloween Man from MonsterVerse Comics. Um, Say hey, Drew. Hello, all you primitive screwheads. <laughs> nice. Uh, Max Meehan, a screenwriter, filmmaker, and the owner of the independent pro wrestling company Inspire Pro. Hello. Say hello, Max. Cool. And from Los Angeles, uh, we have special guest Adam Foschko, story and creative consultant for the acclaimed Call of Duty series, as well as screenwriter and creative producer for the wildly successful Skylander series. Nice. Nice. Anyway, (laughs) so uh, like we said, we're talking Army of Darkness, which is also known as Evil Dead 3, Army of Darkness, and uh, it's a 1992 American comedy dark fantasy film directed by Sam Raimi. It's the third installment of the Evil Dead franchise and was written uh, by Sam Raimi and his brother Ivan. Um, starring Bruce Campbell, of course, and it continues where we left off, sort of, kind of, um, from Evil Dead 2, with Ash Williams being trapped in the Middle Ages and trying to get back home. So, um, I guess let's start uh, with first impressions. Uh, Let's go Max, Adam, then Drew. Oh, man. Okay, so I'm going first? (laughs) Yeah, yeah, yeah. What about Max? I can do this. Um, I'm not exactly sure where everybody else stands on this movie, but uh, I'll, I, I'll I'll just say this, okay? I've, I've never done a drug in my life, but if there were a drug made available that would help me talk shit on this movie more effectively, I would be cutting up rails of it. I am just <laughs> not that much of a fan of this film. Um, and there are numerous reasons why. And, you know, God bless Rainey for getting to this uh to this plateau, if you will, uh, and and you know I I am glad that he found success, but for me this film just feels a little too dry, and I can only really talk from the perspective of a fan. You know I saw this movie because I was a fan of the Evil Dead films. I went in expecting something uh, something more, and after seeing the other two films leading up to this, I think it actually made me dislike it even more because I really don't think I've ever sat down and in succession just watch them all in a really kind of like tight period. Um, but like I said, it feels very dry to me. Uh, there are things about the characters, particularly Ash, that just really irk me. Um, but I'm going to end it at that and just, well, I guess we'll get into this as, as we move forward. Uh, yeah, next. <laughs> Adam? All right, well... I see where the battle lines are being drawn now. Uh, remember how last week I said, you know, that this, compared to the first one and, and the second one, that this movie, because so many things changed in the, in the handling of the picture, that, that this movie failed? Well, you know, I thought about it after the, the show, and, you know, really what I, what I probably should have said was, you know, this movie failed to continue in the same direction, continue, you know, with the same spirit, with the same um, uh, wild kind of, what do we call it last week? It was sort of a conspiratorial kind of feeling of, you know, the Evil Dead series. But I will say, and having seen it again, that, um, you know, where it does succeed, I think, is, you know, if you really unhook it from the other pictures and with a great expectation that it kind of rounds out a trilogy or that it's going to be a, a real continuation in spirit and form, 
to the other two. And I, and I think in that way, I think you really are seeing what amounts to less than Evil Dead picture as more of a, um, a, Sam, a Sam Raimi picture. I think there are a lot of, a lot of things that work in this film that are, are more unabashed um, sort of Sam Raimi-ism. Uh, but it, it really wanders kind of far away from the things that, that certainly I like about the first one and the second one. And I think that's you know, certainly how I felt about it when I first saw it. And I think it's it, it, even more so now that I've seen the other pictures in, in quick succession. I, having said that, I think it's, you know, I think it's better than I remember it. Um, but, you know, I, I do tend to think that it, it improves even more if you really don't think about it. If you don't think about the other two. You really just think of it as a being, as it being a, um, you know, a picture onto itself. Um, you know, it's, it's not so much a, an evil dead as, you know, sort of, um, I don't know. It's, I don't want to say it's evil dead light, but it's just a totally other, it's a totally other thing. It's just a Sam Raimi picture that, you know, is sort of un, unnamed. It's, it's not a continuation, it's a standalone. So I, I tend to move it out of the category of, of um, sales and into the category of, you know, it's a dumb animal. Cool. Drew? Well, the, the first time I saw this movie was at the Dollar Theater in Fort Worth, Texas. And, you know, I'm, I'm not going to get into all that because that's really not how this movie became memorable to me. This was when I was a teenager, and I was just saying this to Max before. Uh, I love this movie as a teenager for all the viewings of like going over the friend's house houses and watching evil dead two and this back to back or just throwing this one on and playing dungeons and dragons while it was on in the background. It's just these movies. And I think in particular, this one has a certain adolescent appeal and I have got, had gone like about two years since the last time I watched this. I got the DVD that I now own uh, around the time that uh, drag me to hell came out because I got it on the two disc set with this and Dragging Me to Hell. And I watched it and I remember feeling slightly disappointed, but it did quite hold up as, as well to those sort of fevered teenage expectations that I had when I was a kid. And then I came back to it now, now having gone, you know, two or three years down the line and I actually quite enjoyed it. You know, I was expecting to maybe enjoy it a little less having watched the other two. And as I've said multiple times during this retrospective, Evil Dead 2 really is my favorite. Like, I just I just love Evil Dead 2. But this, this is fun and it's nice. And it's still got a lot of really odd, offbeat Sam Raimi touches, which I, I like Adam, really appreciate. So it was, it was cool to revisit it. Well, hey, actually, you know, it has charm. I think there's a certain charm that it has. And it's just very different than the other two. It's just something, you're right, you can leave it on while you're doing something else, and it just feels like, oh, okay, I, I like that. Oh, I remember that. Oh, I, like I, I would love to go to a quote-along at the Alamo of this. This is like a perfect I'm, movie for a quote-along. I'm yeah. pretty sure they've done it, but I'm not positive. If they well, haven't me, done it, then there's something truly wrong with yeah, their marketing department. <laughs> I'm pretty sure they have. Um for me, I, you know, watching it this time, it's been a long time, and I'm kind of firmly in the middle. I think there's some fun stuff, but it does not hold up at all. Like, I don't think I'm going to be revisiting it regularly. And I always remembered it with fondness. Like, it came out when I was in college, and, you know, I got to see it, and I, I was in an industrial band, and I had taped all these samples from it, which I was like, oh, these would make great samples. Surely that's, you know, because that's what you did. And I had them all, and I never really used them because I, you know, got tapered off. But, you know, I just thought it was so cool at the time, and we watched it several times. But watching it now, this time around, oof, it was, it was a lot harsher than I thought. And it's really weird because there's so – much talent involved, especially like in the makeup effects, and we we are like Adam said, seeing a Raimi picture, like straight up. 
with all of the Three Stooges stuff he liked to do, which is, you know, big influence on him, and all the stuff that you see carry on into, you know, some of the TV stuff he's worked on, et cetera. But, man, is the humor really raw and really, like, uh, it was it was kind of rough at times this time around, like, watching it. But, um, yeah, I, from my first impression, I'm firmly, like, I don't know if I'm in the in the hate mode, but I'm definitely not as big a fan as I thought I was when I went to go watch it, especially after watching one and two. Like, it's just a, such a totally different movie. And and that's okay. And that's, I kind of like that story, about it. I don't know. I, 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 I think another movie of Ash in a Cabin would have been tedious. I, I, I think that that would have... No, I'm not saying, I'm not saying that. I don't, I don't think there's you no need to horror. have that to, to be you know, a true... Like a true sequel that's the thing and, and and i mean no offense by this but i think like when people justify or try to give this film value by saying well if you don't visit it like it's a it's a true evil dead sequel that's kind of like saying like that transgender prostitute would be really hot if they didn't have a penis it's just you know <laughs> it's, it, it, it's 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 supposed to be a sequel it's like i don't look at like i don't look at dark man like an evil dead film and i don't look at drag me to hell like an evil dead film but i kind of hold this to the standard of it's predecessors, like what was carved out before it. Um, like I I'll said, that. Me, it's supposed that, to be a sequel. Like you can't just go like, oh, well, that's not Evil Dead. It's like, well, it's yeah. got Ash, and it's got you know all the things, and so you're kind of like, hey, well, I remember that thing about Evil Dead. A castle can be scary. We've seen scary castles throughout. I mean, it's yeah. our podcast is the Castle of Horror. You know, to me, it, like, it feels kind of like if Amblin did like an Evil Dead film. It, it has like this kind of like dry to clean kind of like Goonies spirit. There's nothing wrong with the Goonies. You know, I love you know, the Goonies. But... Uh, you know, calling this movie clean, this movie's got too much weird shit in it to call it clean. <laughs> Never. I would say stylistic, it's, it's a lot cleaner. It's pretty sweet. It's more polished, it's... yes. It's got more money well, behind again, it. I think sure. I think what's the definition of clean? Like, yes, it's got gore, but it's not as gory. Uh, I will like, admit that it's not as gory by by <laughs> even a even a. But I mean, this is a, this is a movie with Lilliputian versions of Ash, and they make him swallow one, which then grows out of him into a separate evil version of himself. That's like some weird Silver Age comic book bullshit right there. That's like bizarre. That's not yeah, something you're going to see in a normal movie. And that's not, that's like clean in a different, I mean, that's not clean. You could say that about any Harry House film, though. Like, There's tons of crazy yeah. stuff that happens in a lot of Harry House films, but I wouldn't object to my kids sitting down and watching that. I think it's a, I'm not saying that it's not a creative film. I think it's actually a very well-made film, technically. Like I, like I said, I give, I give Ramey all the, uh, all the, uh, the, the kudos in the world for, for actually realizing this picture. I, I think that there are just, for starters, I think it's a fan, and I know that, you know, there was an abrupt uh, change in the way that they revisited part two, or they revisited, revisited part one in the beginning of part two, like they changed the uh, flashback a little bit. And I think, like, right off the bat, the thing that disappointed me was just how much of a departure it was from where we last left Ash, where he was being cheered and lauded. Um, that they yeah, do work. They do work a variation of that into this, though, which yeah, I, yeah, I, had kind of forgot, I I had kind of forgotten about because. Yeah, but still, it's still I, believe like me, I wish the continuity had been tighter. Well, it's yeah, like the cliffhangers where you see a guy fall off, jump off, you know, a car that's falling off a cliff, and then the next one he's just rolled out of the door, and you're like, yeah, any any he little roll out would have lost her ass on this one. She would have been so angry. Uh, another thing that really bothers me, and this is something that continuously bothers me about films, where you'll have a, pro- a protagonist, right? And the, all these films happen within uh, what, like a, a like a day or two. Like that's that's like when you when you really sit down and think about it, this isn't like a series that's supposed to take place over years, or there's not really supposed to be any gaps in time, right? It's like supposed to happen in pretty quick succession. And sure. You know, one of Ash's main motivations is yeah, he's batshit crazy, but he's also pissed because you know, these things have taken something very precious away from him. And it's, it, I hate it in action movies when a guy loses his woman and a few days later finds another chick to shack up with. That's another thing that just makes me mad about this movie. 
Like <laughs> he just he just has yeah. no honor for the memory of Linda. And no matter how crazy he is, it's kinda of like He was now Bridget like, Fonda. Yeah. <laughs> Well, yeah, yeah. But still, you know, it's, it's the nucleus of his desire to want revenge against these evil things, you know. And he just, Linda's out the window, man. He just does not give a crap. He just wants to get back to his crappy job at S-Mart, you know. Uh, yeah. That's, that's well, he is, anyway. quote, well, an idiot and a jerk. That's Bruce Campbell's actual assessment of the, of the – and I'm not saying technically you're wrong. Like, there is – I don't love this movie to the point where I will say it's flawless. I, flawless. I do wish that there had been a tighter continuity, although it has been weird seeing Bruce Campbell age, like, what, a decade or more over the, the period of three weeks <laughs> now watching these movies back to back to back. Well, time travel will do that to you. We can just look at that. <laughs> uh, but speaking of which, to introduce the movie, what we do have is Ash, unlike the end of the last movie where he shoots a demon and they're like, oh, you are the prophecy, you know, you're the savior. We have him end up kind of a fish out of water and he has to prove himself to uh, is, his medieval compatriots. This is and King Arthur's court. True, very true. Yeah. Um, and we we go with that and, you know, hilarity ensues from there. I mean, it's a very slapstick like, I was surprised at how much more slapstick it was than I even remembered it. Um, and, that, you know, that's, that's fine. It's just a different tone. It's definitely, like we keep saying, though, it's Raimi at maybe even his Raimiest. I don't know. Like, all the Three Stooges stuff. And there's, you know, yeah. sight gags, and there's all kinds of, like, asynchronous sound that's, like, comedy tropes from, you know, Stooges and Costello and, you know, all of that kind of mining that by a lot, and I kind of some of it works, that. I think, for me, and some of it doesn't. But what do you guys think about just the kind of wacky, nutty, you know? Kind I, of, I just I uh, don't like it. I think it's, I think it's too much. I feel I don't know. I just I, I just don't like it. And, and again, this is something that we were talking about. Another thing that really bothers me is that in a lot of the other Rainy films before this. Um, Rainey did a really good job of nodding to the things that really influenced him and that he really loved, but he took those things and he kind of made them his own, whereas here I feel like he's kind of, not even kind of, he's super ham-fisted about, like, kind of throwing his influences on the screen, all all the way down to the uh, Jason and the Argonaut skeleton fight, which is just really just kind of almost a direct rip-off of what we've seen in another film, whereas... Even in the specifically the the previous Evil Dead films, there were you know nods to things that that you know he really liked, but he put them in such an odd context, and he kind of wrapped them in his own flavor. It was it, it made them unique and forgivable. Whereas here, there are just things that I've seen before, and it's just it feels like really like his influence is really stripped down and just kind of just thrown out there. What about uh, you know not the. Not not to defend it too much. I definitely think Evil Dead 2 does a better balancing act of sort of the weirdness of this universe, like tempered against the sort of slapstick comedy dialed up to 20. Like, this has definitely got a lot of that. And I, I do sort of wish that they would have dialed that back just a little bit so we could see... Well, I mean, a little bit of example. Yeah, but I mean, you've got things like the skeleton guy, who, and it's a really kind of neat piece of makeup and prosthetic, but, you know, his skull goes open and he's like, and his eyes roll around and it makes crazy sounds and it makes. Yeah. Noise. And, like, yeah. it feels really like. But it's not just that guy. It's like that happens, like, a bunch of times throughout the movie. And, like I said, I had forgotten how much that kind of stuff happened. And that's yeah. why, like, I think this time around, it doesn't really work as well. Yeah, and, me, and, and in Evil Dead 2, like, Evil Dead 2, if you kind of look at it, you know, the, the humor is kind of like this sweet gel cap that gets you to swallow something that is ultimately more devious and screwed up, you know, than, than yeah. you can imagine. It's like the humor really diffuses it so that you can just accept it and then you're kind of like, oh, my God, what what am I laughing at? And in this film, I feel like the the horror element is, is 
partially the jokes happen. It's just making you swallow all this, like, weird crime wave-esque humor, like the slapstick in that film. Like, I feel, I feel like this film feels more like that. Yeah. I, at, well, I, I don't want to, I don't want to jump over Adam because I haven't heard from him in a while, but, um, did we lose Adam? No, no. I'm taking it all in. How do you, well, before, I have something I want to say, but what do you th- what do you think about all of this? Well, I mean, I, I, I think we've said different versions of sort of the same thing, and that is that this really is Raimi at his Raimiest. And I, I, I kind of stand by that. And I, and I think that, you know, you really see, you're really watching a Sam Raimi picture, jokes and all. And, and incidentally, I'm not against the idea of taking extremely familiar elements that we've seen many times before and then recombining it in, in a way that is, you know, fresh. I don't necessarily believe that, I mean, certainly Avatar is, is that and many other things, but, and this is no Avatar, but, uh, you know. I like this movie better than Avatar. Yeah, you know, but I mean, <laughs> and that's a whole other different podcast. But I mean, this is, you know, it is. I think completely so again to take influences and, 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 and the more than influences. I think, you know, out and out bits, familiar bits, there's something about taking the familiar elements and recombining them into something new that I think gives something legs and actually creates a lot of appeal. And I think it makes it very mass market. And, and, I, and I, I, I'd be curious to see, uh, to hear what um, kind of the studio's involvement was in this particular picture and, and what you know, went into making it because what we're looking at, I believe, and you said a, a, a version of this, and, and that is that in the first pictures, you really had fright, you had horror, you had sense, you had all this stuff, but you had the, and that was the main course. And, uh, and the spice that went with it really was the weird and quirky sense of humor and the bits that would go in and you'd be like, oh my God. And sometimes you're right, Max, you would go, what the hell am I laughing at? Oh my God, but it's funny. And here what we've got is we've got way more spice and a lot less main course. We're really not dealing, we have the the world and a context, which is generally kind of in the milieu of kind of the origins of the horror we witnessed in the first two, but it's not horrific in the same way not suspenseful in the same way, but it is, you know, it is really the, you know, the, whatever I think people believe the formula was cranked up to 20. I think that's, I think that's accurate. So, you know, I think if you're, a, I think it probably appeals to a very particular kind of person who likes these kind of pictures. They could watch Evil Dead 1, or if they didn't see Evil Dead 1, they saw Evil Dead 2, they went, oh, I like this. And then they were like, I like the humor, I like the stuff, I like, you know, the blood, I like all the over the topness of it. And it was like, well, what will, what will be the next best, biggest thing? I know, you know, we'll make, we'll make a, the, you said it earlier, uh, a Connecticut Yankee and Carolina court with Ash in the, you know, in the distant past with the Deadite, and it'll be a fish out of water, and we're going to really crank up all the things that are I love. Who's our audience? They'll love this. And, you know, I think they just told Bamey or he felt like he wanted to go to town. And I think it was, you're looking at people going to town on really what, you know, they thought the elements of this picture that people really liked, I, I think, were. It may have been even more than just Randy really wanting in his soul to do this movie. I think it really was probably trying to elaborate on the franchise, you know, by cranking things up to 11. And uh, the, the thing about it is, you know, I think it, I think there is an audience for this picture. I think there are some people, you know, um, particularly at the um, time when it came out and now, who I think love the mix. It just may not appeal yeah. to... No, I, I, I think it's totally, safe to I say totally that this is probably the yeah. most popular of the three with most people. Like, every yeah, when, I, when I talk about this trilogy, this is this seems to be, hands down, the most popular. That's and I think you're absolutely point. correct. This is a pop film. It, and it's kind of funny because it pertain, as it pertains to like the feud between Craven and and Raimi, where they were like pointing fingers at each other, going, "No, what you're doing is pop poor." And then Raimi eventually ends up taking this centerpiece, which was supposed to be kind of like this weird arty indie horror pick, and doing it in a very commercial kind of way. You know, I think that's that's, that's kind of ironic. But 
and and I totally understand where you're coming from, you know. But I can only speak as someone who like watched the films and was excited about this film and had in my own mind, you know, kind of imagined where Ash was going, you know, after after the film. And and I'm sure and for me, I don't even feel like it's eleven personally. I think it's over. It feels restrained, you know, because because like I feel I feel like it 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 probably would have gone in a completely different different direction had Remy had the money to do it, but it hadn't been done at Universal. And uh, this is another thing I wanted to touch upon. We talk we talk about. I mean, this is this is not done by you know by means of Dino De Laurentiis's money. This is a Universal Studios picture, and oh, uh, right. and Dean, Dino's involved. But there, there, there's also there are also other outside forces. Um, one of the things that I remember reading in Fangoria back in the day, and this is something that I don't ever really read about, is that uh, a few years before they had done Child's Play two, and Child's Play two was this big boon at the box office. It did pretty well for what it was and what it cost. And so, like even before the second one had hit theaters, they were actually working on writing the third one. And then the third one came out, and they invested in it, and it was a turkey. And uh, I remember reading in Fangoria that uh, Universal's position on horror sequels and horror films in general had started to kind of shift, and that it sort of tampered and even maybe tempered this production a little bit. And I've always heard that that's like another explanation why there was no Evil Dead in the title. And that's so the, not that it's directly related. It's just so funny to me to think of Universal being, of all studios, being the the studio that was suddenly shying away from from horror movies and monster movies, considering what what they've definitely historically been the most successful. Well, you'd be at. surprised once, like, oh no, 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 the, no the left hand doesn't know what the right hand is doing. I mean, like I said before, we worked on that Universal Kid Monsters game. And we were constantly amazed at trying to talk to the Universal Studios and then who's running the video game department and everything like that. You know, we just wanted to use the monsters we wanted to use. And it it, it gets really crazy, especially once money is of any sort is involved and multiple yeah. projects. Like, oh, oh I, don't, I don't doubt it. It just, sort of breaks like, my, it just sort of breaks my heart in theory because, I mean, we, anybody who's oh, yeah. listened to this That's podcast, yeah. yeah. No, it's well, big of a Universal Monsters guy I am. Yeah, I mean, once you see how the sausage is made, <laughs> it's pretty. It's sometimes kind of crappy, um, mm-hmm. as far as that goes. You know, and a lot of this too. Like, I really kind of wish I could have seen this again on the big screen, because this was the first time for me, and and it kind of breaks my heart because there's some really awesome effects. In, in, and it's almost all practical, and that is just, wow, that floored me. But there's something about the way it was lit, This I noticed this time around, like, for all the money they spent on it, it's still, there's some kind of cheap feeling parts to it. And it really That's kind of broke my heart it. in a way, like, really? that, yeah, like, I just felt like, wow, that, that doesn't really look as good as I remembered, or this doesn't look as good as I remembered, or wow, that's a really awesome, like, practical thing, but it doesn't quite gel for me. And well, the I thing that really I really sad. think about is that the, the big battle at the at the end, at the castle, where they're just sort of, uh, it looks like at some point where they're just tossing skeleton dummies at Bruce Campbell, and they, they're so, <laughs> obvious, so obviously yeah. fake. You know, I, I, yeah. the... the, the the fakeness of it isn't quite as in de- That is the one thing about knowing that this is a studio picture. It's like when something is obviously fake and it's it's homegrown like the original Evil Dead is, you're a little bit more forgiving. But when you know something's had all kinds of money pumped into it, and this is probably still relatively, let's, to be fair, probably relatively low budget for for the sort of things that were coming out in the during the time period, but it, you're, you're just a little, you know, I just find myself being a little less forgiving. Having said that, like, there's a lot of wonderful sequences in here that, mm-hmm. that are what keeps me rewatching, like, the whole sequence in the windmill with the tiny ashes 
It's just great. Yeah, to, you know, really borders like on being psychedelic. It's wonderful. Well, it's weird. Like I said, like there's parts of it that work really, really well, and I feel like maybe, you know, maybe it feels like some somewhere along the way, unfettered from the kind of like we have to keep it small, like parts of it felt like they got away. And, like, Nicotero and company do an awesome job at a lot of really great effects. But something about, like, just the difference between, like, the hag at the beginning, you know, the hag in the pit, and then when you really see her in, like, direct light, <laughs> like sunlight and stuff, just kind of doesn't hold up as well. You know, that's why I'm saying, like, I kind of wish I had seen it on a big screen and seen if that – because sometimes, like, seeing cheaper effects on a small screen really, you just don't get it the same way. And and I like to watch a lot of, you know, I've seen a lot of low-budget stuff, and I like a lot of it. But it it feels like something, like I said, for me, this time around, there were sequences that really worked, like the Tiny Ash one really works, and there were others that just, I, I didn't remember them quite looking the way that they did. And you it, know, I... I don't know. It's really weird, like and I like I said, uh, it it, it kind of hurts me because like, of course I don't want to slag. You know, these are some luminaries as far as practical effects, and I'm not really trying to slag on their work or anything. But I I don't know where I lost this particular magic, and that made me kind of sad. Like when I when I finished the movie, I was like, wow, I I wonder what changed, what happened to me? <laughs> Why doesn't this work for me as much as maybe others? I, I said this to Max before we started uh, recording. I think that this is a movie that was very much made with, with an adolescent, like adolescent boy specifically, like a teenage. This this movie just works very well. When, when you know something about the when I watched it today, you know I I, I came in with this a little bit more of a. I don't know. Like I, I felt like I was in a much more <laughs> the sound ridiculous for a second, but youthful mood where, you know, I uh, the immature stuff about this movie didn't didn't quite get to me. Whereas like the the last time I watched it, I I was working a security job. It was overnight. I had just had to deal with running some some homeless people off the off the set that I was on, and you know, I was in kind of a bitter mood. And I think that definitely affects the way you watch it and it's it's not necessarily a movie that benefits from you being a little bit more in a more cynical frame of mind because then like this stuff like the continuity errors and you know the at times dodgy special effects they're going to stand out to you a lot more whereas if you're in like the right kind of mood like the silly one-liners and <laughs> the sort of but again, batshit craziness to some of the visuals like that. You're just going to get swept up in that and, and dig on it. Yeah. So we talked a little bit about it. Um, something that, that, you know, we touched on was Ash's portrayal in this um, and kind of his, his arc. What do you guys think about this particular Ash? The one who starts in a S Mart and then, it's kind of, you know, what we said, kind of a jerk and kind of an idiot, you know. Well, that's Bruce Campbell's own description of Ash. <laughs> right, right. No, no, I'm saying that's yeah. um, but I, he's, I know, know, really he's a little bit like of a different Ash. I think he's a very different Ash. I, I don't really see a lot of the jerk qualities in him in the previous films. Like in the first film, he's very kind of sensitive and, and, and meek, and he, he kind of has to step up and then, Part two is is very much about his descent into madness, and I think madness is a key word, and I don't necessarily think that it should it's it's you know exclusive with being kind of a dickhead, and he's kind of a jerk. He's he's not very likable in this movie, whereas in, in the previous film, I kind of saw him as this this underdog who was just he would just not stop swinging. Here he just he just seems kind of like he's yeah he's just a flat out jerk. Um, and I, I, you know, obviously that has its value. It's, you know, uh, if you view this film as a standalone film, the character is what it is, obviously. Um, he's funny. He's funny to watch, but I, I'm not necessarily a fan of the Ash in this film. I, 
you know, the, I, 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 I think I might be reading too much of the stuff I, I read about Campbell talking about the character that I read earlier today, but there was a, a, a description of him from Campbell is that him and Sam Raimi envisioned him in this movie is that in his regular life, he's just this retail wage slave, but this fighting and fighting the evil dead, he's found the only thing that he's actually really good at. And that's why we have the suddenly this blow hard version of Ash. Now I do enjoy, I'm, I'm, I'm like I said, I'm immature enough to where I do just sort of get off on, you know, the one liners. I mean, who doesn't love good, bad. I'm the guy with a gun, but I do miss the the sort of Evil Dead Two has a again <laughs> Evil Dead Two has kind of walks the right line with this, whereas you have you know, the the wife cracking you know the wife cracking Ash, where it still has a little bit of the the sensitive wounded Ash that, that you you get in part one, and then certainly a large parts of part two uh, you know as for why he's like this i mean the only the only real explanation is this, you know he's, he's off his rocker and he's had enough well yeah and you've got a really really good point and that is that you know uh, I, I think there are, there are two different questions at work and that is you know who who is your favorite ash and then you know Who's the right Ash? I would even go so far to say for this picture. I think the one that's in the picture now, or I'm in darkness, is the right Ash for this picture. I think he's just the right guy. And there's something about something entertaining about watching him. However, my favorite Ash, I mean, if, or, or if you are trying to boil down and distill really the things about Ash that I like, or where would I put him? I put him squarely in Evil Dead 2, and I think we've said it in a couple of different ways, but. Probably because he's a character that, in a weird way, you can relate to in, in, in the circumstances that he's in, and he descend, you're with him in his descent into madness, and then through it, and I mean, he does have, he changes throughout the picture, and then he really, you know, you know he is in an untenable, difficult, twisted, fucked up situation, and but he's very human and accessible, and still over the top, and it's funny, and whatever else, but he's not probably in control. He's not wife smacking in the same way that he is fear. He's a much more relatable Ash, and I think he's the snapshot of the Ash that I like best. But this is the one I think that you want for this movie. If you're going to make this kind of movie, then you, you're probably going to want this Ash in it, because he's the one that's right for the picture. I, I kind of go with that. Like, and I still, I'm, you know, I'm definitely agree with Drew. Like, I have Love the one-liners. Like I said, I had a whole... I recorded all my favorite parts on, you know, I'm going to use these samples. It's such a great movie. Like, I mean, it really... And I've heard those those bits for years since then, you know. Um, and I really I really like it. I there, think there's bits of this Ash that I really like. And he is kind of the, the guy who comes to power. And then what would you do if you were, you know, not the brightest guy in the world and all of a sudden you come to power? Um... You know, you might act like this Ash, and I kind of do agree with with Max though. Like, he's not really all that broken up about uh, his girlfriend. But again, you know, maybe you would change if you know she tried to to uh, do all the terrible things that his uh, you know demon possessed girlfriend tried to do. <laughs> and uh, and maybe I'll that time travel also affects you. So. I think you draw a line, you know, between the two pictures. I think it's, you know, I think everything that happens before you go, ah, girlfriend? Yeah, I look, if you're watching it in continuity and you're watching it, you know, in, in short order, then, yeah, I think back to the girlfriend. But, I, you know, in, in watching it as a, you know, as its own experience, I'm not really at all thinking about that. Sure. I understand it, but I'm not, you know, I like that. I'm just not, you know, I just don't see it. I just, I mean, I think it's easy to say when you're, if you're viewing it as a standalone film, yeah, but it's, it, like, you know, it's part of a trilogy. It's still, like, I mean, you can you can look at any, any film, you know, as separate from, you know, its franchise. Like, you can do that with the Dirty Harry films, but still, you know, 
it's still part of something larger, you know. And if a character does something, in my opinion, that's uncharacteristic, it it tends to kind of ruin it. Maybe that's me being too fanboy. Maybe that's me being too, you know, too too much of a fan. But as and I will say this, I when I was a kid, Brainy was kind of a god to me, you know. So. For me, this felt like a misstep. For me, I went into I went into the theaters and I did I did see this in the theater. Like I, I and I was completely familiar with the other films. You know, it there were things that really really bothered me. Uh, also, the the thing about him being an idiot, I don't get. Is he is he supposed to be uh, a complete nitnik or or what? Because then you've got him building mechanical hands. I mean, he seems to have oh, yeah. all this chemistry yeah. yeah. knowledge. And, Good Come on, man! I mean, like, is is he an idiot, or is he some, or is he some like college professor a, who's just got who's down on his luck? I think I mean, blowhard is probably the best description of Ash. Yeah. I, I I think he's a blowhard. I in this movie he's a blowhard. Yeah, well, yeah, and that's what I'm. That's what I am. That is what I am referring to. I you know, as far as uh, the stuff with Linda, like, I wish that stuff was there. I will say that. <laughs> I think the, the logical reason behind that is the passage of time between the two movies. Like, I think sure. when they got to this, I'm sure, uh, you know, on a creative level, I'm sure there was sort of like, oh, we're bored with the story arc, let's do, let's do this. And I'm not saying that's the right decision, but I'm sure there probably was a lot of people like, yeah, well, no one's going to care about Linda. She's, she's Bridget Fonda in a flashback. You know, it's... it's you know, we don't need to, to well, do it. Well, I'm not good. How about this? People who are blowhards, characteristically, you know, are masking pain. You know, there is an over the top as they as they really try and mask pain. The pain that he masked, the part is descending the madness and through all the crap he's been through. One of those things is the loss of Linda. And it, it hardly explains why he's such a fucking blowhard. Because he is now callous and trying to mask the pain. Now here in the distant past, surrounded by, you know, swarming undead. You know, I do, you know, when you, <laughs> that's a good point. When when you ask, like, he's supposed to be an idiot, you know what I think of? I really think maybe he was just that guy who was really uh, good in, like, shop class. You know, shop class like, doesn't uh, teach you how to build cyborg like, I think limbs. He was the guy like, what shop class like, does he go to? <laughs> I don't know, but you know, just a natural aptitude. Probably didn't like do super well at school, but hey, you know, you learn enough to where you can build a medieval bionic arm and a and a, uh, you know, get <laughs> some people to with the with the help of a of a chemistry book and some odds and ends, you get the medieval guys to build you a car with like a windmill thing on the front. I mean, is I do kind of I do like the Gonzo ridiculousness of of all of that, you know that final battle where it's like just kind of goes Looney Tunes. That is, there's some some really good bits in that. Um, you know, I like his kind of choice when he's kind of pick out the books and one of them bites him, and there's all that kind of yeah. stuff. I I wish that like some of the Harry House and stuff. I I do still wonder why it seems to work a little better in Harryhausen if it was just because that's what I grew up with. But some parts of it here didn't seem like they gelled quite as well either. And I'm I'm still like trying to wrap my head around that. Well, I mean, we gotta we gotta good, be fair though. Great. Like we're we're you're you're saying this doesn't work for you and you you grew up on uh, Ray Harryhausen movies, but so did I and I don't mind all the walking skeletons. I think they're cool. Is it because is it because Harryhausen and I grew up on it too and loved it dearly and you know still will have, watch it you know and be like that's oh, still really awesome and you know figure out how they worked on it and all that stuff but the the magic of it the fact that it it didn't didn't take it so seriously that's the wrong way to put it but it was serious and this is done um, in a way that. No, it doesn't take itself seriously at all. It's done, you know, in a very broad, far out style, and it's not, I don't know, it's not treated in all the same way. Uh, I, don't, can, I don't think it has the drama of the reveal that Harry Housen had 
I don't think that's, and I think that we, you know, I, I feel like I hold a hold a very high stuff in the way which is different because it's treated in an entirely different way. I think this is just, you know, it's that bit, but but seen through an entirely different lens, and and one that doesn't take it, doesn't treat it at all with the same sort of seriousness. Uh, and you know, and I, and I think that's, I think that's certainly why, you know, I, I feel like the Harryhausen stuff was done better because it's presented in a way that for me is a lot more appealing. This is good for what it is, but it's not, it's not really the same thing, even though the effect is technically kind of the same. Right. Yeah, I yeah. I, I can agree with that. Yeah, I think I think so. I just maybe, and again, you know, I think part of my viewing of this too is having such fond memories of of it in the past, you know, and seeing it this time something I don't know something wasn't quite there, and that's kind of a like I said it makes me a little well, sad. I've, <laughs> I've been where you are, Tony. Like I said, the last time I watched this movie, I was thoroughly disappointed, and I don't know what it was, but something about it this go around actually you know clicked in the right places well it, like like well still acknowledging that it has a lot of it has a lot of technical flaws that 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 bother me sure. like if I'm gonna look at it critically but it's you know it's it, this is a movie where awesome trumps logic like for example right. there's the point oh, yeah. where he pulls his shotgun out and shoots the sword off and that's awesome. Yeah, but I agree. He previously did not have the the, the shotgun in his little pack in any yes. of the previous scenes. <laughs> I am okay I with that because that, it's like so about cool. Three times, I rewound. I was like, "Wait, the sorcerer guy like threw his chainsaw down," and I kept like rewinding, like, "What? Why did? What did I miss?" <laughs> <laughs> and then and then I'm like, "Oh, it just they he just did that." Okay, you know what's what's kind of cool though is when you see this ash and the way he quips. And and kind of mugs, then you're like, no wonder he was the perfect Elvis for uh you know for playing like uh, uh, when he's in, uh, when he's a Bubba Hotep like you're like oh, that makes sense and you can see where you know Don Coscarelli was like okay yeah you know like there's bits in there in in this movie where I was watching it going yeah okay I can see how this totally leads to, to well, Bubba Hotep we're, we're... you know. You're being critical of this movie, but again, this is kind of a beloved cult film now. I sure. mean, there's there's a lot of people that this is their not just their favorite Evil Dead movie, but their favorite movie. Period. Like I, I run across them at just about every <laughs> every convention I go to when I get to talking about these movies. And it's, I'm, yeah, is, I'm is it sure really a cult film? Some, I don't think it's a cult some, film. I think it's a pop film. I think how is this not a cult film? Yes, because because it is so widely accepted and well known. I don't think it's like this okay, isn't well known enough. This isn't well known enough. Like let's let's be fair. This movie did I, not make a ton of movies. This movie did know. not. This movie did not make a ton of money at the box office. The success came on being a, a hit it, on video. It, 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 it did okay. It it, it more than, it, it it did all right. I mean, it, somebody it, looked it, that up on box office mojo. It, it I don't about, remember this movie I, I, I doing. Know, that. I, I know I know exactly what it made at the box office. It made it made about it made about eleven million. It cost about thirteen million to make, which is really interesting because the first film cost what thirty grand. Part two cost three million. This cost thirteen million. I mean, I think it. I think most everybody. I know a lot of people that know Army of Darkness. I mean, it's 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 a it's a surefire crowd pleaser. I mean, I don't I don't know. I just I don't view it as a as being in the same league as I guess this depends film. on I guess this depends on what you what you think of the think, cult film, but I would definitely I think say also, this is a cult film. I think also perhaps it's a cult film um for people like who aren't deep into it. Like it is off the beaten path and it was for a long time on video as well. Oh man, did you see Army of Darkness? That kind of thing. But it was yeah. I mean widely distributed, especially on VHS and Fairly yeah. highly anticipated because Evil Dead kind of had a Evil Dead Two kind of had a pickup as well. So people were excited about this movie and they wanted, oh man, Evil Dead Two, yeah, because it is it is really taken off on video. So it's 
So there was excitement about it. I think for a lot of people, not necessarily, you know, hardcore horror fans, but for a lot of people it is, man, you know, that's a weird movie for me. Because you'll, you'll see a few movies like that where you can talk to somebody who maybe isn't as hardcore as we are, and they have a different kind of movie that they're like, man, that's a weird one. And for us, like, oh, okay. You know, and, and so I think that's part of it. Where it's maybe not as cult as we think of cult, but it's still off the beaten path, or it was for a really long time. Um, well, and I know, don't even think video. this movie is as weird as, as Dark Man, which was no, you know, no, certainly, sure. much, <laughs> certainly much more informative of where Sam Raimi's career ended up. And I don't even like it as much as, and this is going to cost me some street cred, but I like The Quick and the Dead more than I like Army of Darkness, and that's a way more polished movie wow. than this, and it's not exactly... And it's not exactly a well liked movie. <laughs> I'll agree with you. No, yeah. you know what? I will. I will agree with you. I actually like the quick. I like for the love of the game more than I like Army of Darkness. Well, let's is, not go crazy now. No, I'm, <laughs> a little crazy. I'm, I'm a little crazy. But here, here's here's what I'm saying as far as it being like this. You know, first of all, I'm sure that there's crossover. I'm sure that a lot of uh, people that fans love this. Um, I think that the kind of people who are, like, super entrenched in cult culture typically tend to, like, love Evil Dead 2 more than this one. This is the film that, that, that spawned, may be true. That may spawned, be true. I can agree with that. And this spawned, you got to consider this, this, this is the movie that spawned video games. Video games. Toys. I mean... Video this, games and toys that came out, like, almost a decade later. Like, we didn't see, because, the, see any of that stuff until, like, the late 90s, early aughts. Yeah, yeah. Like that's like still, a slow I mean, trickle. To, and, like, there was this whole horror culture that started to develop over the 90s that did not exist when this movie came out. I still kind of perceive this to be a horror film for people that don't like horror films, and I think that it's, it's got a lot of crossover. After all, it was, it was designed to be more marketable, more commercial. I mean, it, and I think it definitely succeeds on all those bumps. Like, I think it is successful in terms of what... What they were, what they were motivated to create. I think they succeed. I think it is a really, it's a really good, safe, accessible film. And that's not a knock. I'm not, I'm not knocking it at all. But in terms of the flavor, it's not, it's not what I. I don't know if I can call this movie super accessible because, like I said, it didn't. It was hard. I, to I totally, I, I will disagree with you there, Drew. Like, it's as far as, again, I go back to movies that are, I mean, it has a huge following, like you said. People go, that's my favorite film, or that's my at least my favorite horror film. Um, when you, it's I, not I a horror film. I will say it's not a horror film. It's not a horror film. This is a that. fantasy but movie. Some people, yes, but to some people it is because of all the horror elements. Again, this is what kind of what we're talking but about. Like, horror, when horror it's, it's fantasy. When we're arguing, yes, hold up. It's when we're arguing about what is gritty, or what is, like, Evidently, our ideas of what's polished, as well as our ideas of what's cult, are different. And I think that this crosses over in a lot better ways because of very specific choices that were made to make this more of a crossover film. It is meant to be more mainstream. Is it mainstream? Of course not. Like, it's crazy town. But is it more mainstream than Evil Dead? Two, yes. Is it way more mainstream than Evil Dead 1? And I think that's why it succeeds in ways for some people that those, the previous movies may not. You know what I mean? I, I, will agree with, I will agree with all of those points. And uh, like I said, uh, to me, this is... Look, horror and fantasy are, are cousins. Like, and this, this, so, like, they're, and they're because of the heavy use of the supernatural and, and monsters or in this case the sure. undead like it's a short walk but to, to me this is like you called this a dark fantasy movie and I'm assuming you read that off of Wikipedia but I think that's about as apt of a description as, as you're gonna, gonna get I, mean, like, I, would, I, I, huh? I would say it's a dark comedy adventure I mean it's an adventure yeah. movie in many many yeah. cases less than it is a horror but to some that's, people yeah. Uh, it's gonna be, they're going to classify it as they're going to classify it as a horror movie because it's got a lot more horror elements than you know name like almost any you know fantasy true fantasy movie. You know? Well, yeah, a true fantasy movie is certainly not going to have a guy with a chainsaw for a hand. I mean that yeah, yeah. That's, that's that's you know. 
and the, 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 when I think of something being mainstream and polished, it's not going to have foam rubber skeletons being tossed at your lead actor. Like that, that, or, you know, again, the whole sequence in the windmill, like that, sure. that's not normal. Like it's, it's, it's creative, but like really what is normal? And, and when you say that like a, 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 this can't really be a complete plot film, I got to challenge you there because you have to go and you have to look at like, I mean, Look at The Exorcist. I mean, there's some downright crazed stuff that happens in The Exorcist. And it is it was a huge blockbuster at the time. I mean, I wouldn't call a lot of it normal, but it still appealed to a mass, a mass, mass audience, and it made a lot of money. I mean, to me, a cult movie is a movie that's usually not initially successful, and I don't know that I would call this movie... Like I said, I saw this movie in the dollar theater. That, that usually means it's had a pretty quick jettison out of... <laughs> Out of it, first run theaters. If it, it, if it made if it made eleven million before hitting the home video market, it did pretty good. That, that's uh, my sure. that's my appraisal. That's my I, appraisal. I, I, the cost I, I again the tomato tomato. I think your 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 and I's idea of a cult movie or, or maybe slightly slightly different, but it. <laughs> This is it's like to me like okay mainstream movie that's, that that we can compare this movie. This isn't Star Wars. Like this has got and Star Wars has weird shit in it. But it's, and Star Wars certainly has a rabid following. It's like maybe sure. the most rabid of any following. But I, I, this is inaccessible in the same way that Star Wars is accessible. I will have yeah. to say that if you're gonna the one thing I you know about it is. It did a lot of the right thing to bring the Evil Dead kind of franchise into a more mainstream. Like more people are going to watch this. If it had been straight up yeah. horror, but with the slapstick, yeah. like oh, absolutely, they'd read this, absolutely. You know, Evil Dead Two again, this wouldn't have the same following that it does. And well, back in the back in the nineties, I knew a lot of people that saw this movie and had no idea it was a sequel to anything until I told them to, and this caused them to go back and check out right. Evil Dead 1 and 2. And, and, that's I, awesome. and, I think, and I think a lot of people did that. Yeah. I don't well, think, I think there's anything wrong with that. I like, I think that's great. I think, I think its beginnings surely were cultish in the, in the sense of Evil Dead 1. The Evil Dead 1 really seemed very much like a cult picture. I, and the Evil Dead 2 you know, a little more, you know, a little more uh, practice and a little more, you know, craft to it, a little more, uh, you know, but it's still kind of cultish. And this, you know, I think we said it, is a, is a, a more mainstream expression, a uh, studio, a more studio version of, um, you know, of a picture in that, in that franchise. And, you know, has cultish elements to it. I think that sure. because it got wider distribution, because it had more of a budget, because it had you know more money behind P and A, I think more people saw it. And the advent of you know where home video was at the time and DVD when it came out, um, I I think that you know it 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 broadened the you know the access to um, the franchise. I don't know what people thought when they went back and they saw, you know, Ash from, you know, Evil Dead One and Two after seeing this one. And uh, I don't know what it lo- I don't know what it looks like to look at Ash through the lens of Evil Dead Three for the first time. You know, I imagine it's very different from how we, you know, view him having seen him in One and Two and then Three, sort of in order. So, um, you know, I think in 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 the sense of what the studio did, I think mission accomplished. I think they did what certainly what they probably set out. To do so, I, I tend to think that it um, failed to continue the, in the same vein as one and two, but was highly successful in its in its uh, plan to um, appeal to a larger audience to actually make cult, a cult picture uh, more mainstream. So I, I kind of think you're both right in a lot of ways. It really has to do with well, it, it, performance, but I, I, I won't disagree that it's. It. I won't disagree yeah. that it's it's way more mainstream than than the other two. I mean, by the fact that it has more money into it, it simply makes it more mainstream. But it hasn't completely shaken off the DNA of its predecessors, and I guess that's the point. Oh, no, definitely that, not. 
Yeah, yeah. yeah. No, and, and, and I think it wouldn't have worked if they, if they totally shake it off. But I think we're reacting to the fact that certainly if the DNA is present, you know, because the genotype is there, that's great. But, but the phenotype, you know, the animal looks a little bit different, smells different than the other two, even though the DNA is the same. I think that's one of the things that we're reacting to. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Uh, yeah. <clears throat> I I know under the under the hood, under its skin, it may be the may come from the same you know the same stock, but you know I think it's a lot of the mix has been changed to you know to really crank. I was somebody said earlier um, it was um, that awesome beats logic. I think awesome trumps everything in this. You know, it's like Michael Bay does a horror picture. It's, you know, it's awesome. It's a it's a house from everything with screwball comedy. And then, it, you know, it just becomes this completely different thing. And, and because of it, in a, in a really fucked up, odd way, I felt like it's a co-conspirator in Evil Dead 1 and Evil Dead 2. Now I kind of feel like I'm sort of, it's almost like being on this crazy rock. It's like being on this trip. And you kind of go, okay, I'm... I'm on board. Let's see what happens. It's not at all the same kind of thing. I, and I feel like I'm watching it happen as opposed to sort of being a part of it because it's just this entire blast of stuff. I'm going, oh, my God, what's this? Oh, my God, I didn't expect that. It's not Evil Dead, but it's Evil Dead-ish-esque, Evil Dead-esque. Sure. And maybe that's, you know, that's all it needed to be. Yeah, I'll, I'll go with that. Definitely. And that's, again, why, you know, what you're talking about is why, like, it has a lot of the stuff I love and why I was, a, like I said, a little, just kind of sad. <laughs> it, I don't know. How I, much I, I didn't like it as much this time because I was like, oh, man, I remember digging this more, you know? Um, yeah. I guess that's just the nature of cinema. But, uh, to me, it feels which, like they're, guess, they're, really, they're really cool beats and, like, cool parts to it, but I don't, sure. I don't feel like it flows as well as the other films just from... Like you know, logic, awesome aside, whatever. Like the to me, it the story just doesn't like do it for me. It feels kind of, I don't know, just just from that even that basic level. Like I feel like, I feel like rather than having a bunch, it feels like when someone writes a martial arts movie and like a lot of it's kind of like a lot of Donnie Yen films. I'm a huge Donnie Yen fan, but most of his films, uh. The, the nucleus of it are just a bunch of cool fight scenes that they came up with, and then they have to find a way to kind of weave something around those fight scenes to make them fit into a story. And I feel like that's kind of maybe what happened here to an extent. And and, and it's like you said, you know, with the stu- studio studio involvement, uh, passage of time, I'm I, I'm kind of always been of the opinion that there was probably a lot of outside interference that maybe – in my opinion, if this hadn't been made by these people, like, not Raimi, but, you know, the, the, the producers involved, it probably would have been a completely different film, but not... I, th- I think it could have still been mainstream, but... But I feel like it, it went on a ride of its own that made the impact... It would be, it would be interesting to see what the independent version of this would have been, like, a movie more like what we see at the end of Evil Dead 2. And I will always be curious about that. Yeah, like, I yeah. do I do enjoy this movie, but, like, there is the part of me is like, man, I really would love to have seen that movie, you know, Medieval Dead, you know, what, what they were going to call it. And I, I, in which I still think is a better title, because I feel like Army of Darkness is really... It totally is. It's amazing. Yeah. So, speaking of which, I guess we should probably wrap up pretty soon. Um, but what do you think uh, about the two different endings? Like, which is your preferred ending? Um, you know, because the one I watched today was definitely not the director's cut ending where, you know, Ashley's F smart and it's just hellish, you know. <laughs> but um, what, what's your preferred ending, everybody? Um, I, prefer, I prefer the director's cut ending, which is also like a, a really weird thing that they kind of, kind of like rejected it because if you were if, if this had been wildly successful say and 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 I still think it was successful because the 11 million it made was only the US gross I don't know what it did like globally but you know these films had a life of their own in, in like say Italy and and whatnot but um it would have seemed like a really much more fascinating point to do a sequel from like if this had been commercially it seemed like a better idea like I mean I know it's kind of like that weird cliffhanger thing again but 
I, I would have rather seen uh, post-apocalyptic Mad Max Ash rather than Ash fighting Deadites and S-Mart, personally. But that's, well, that's actually something they pick up in, in, in some of the, the comic books that they, they did based on that. But, uh, you know, I don't really have a strong opinion on which ending I like better. I mean, there's a completeness to to the the studio cut you know it does it does feel like the you know you you want especially having watched all three movies back to back it does feel like the end of a you know at the end of a trilogy but yeah as, as max said the, the post-apocalyptic ending does make for an interesting setup if they had intended on doing another one and uh you know you certainly could have had a had you had a lot more excuses for Ash coming up with crazy extra appendages to replace his hand with <laughs> in the far future. I I yeah. also think that it really it really like that the the director's cut ending. If you really like the the jerk Ash, it's so much more I think fulfilling to see this this smug jerk get bit in the ass by just like his like yeah I know everything kind of you know hand wave you know it's it, it really it, it's really his own character screwing him even more and that's that's one of the reasons I I do like it I think it I think it's more character involved and and really fun well, also does hit the beat of where he's like no I you know where yet again he doesn't get the words right and uh you know, I will the words which they borrow from the day the earth stood still, by the way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I was going to yeah. say, like, I really do like their steadfastness for sticking with the nod to day the earth stood still. That's just awesome. But um, we should wrap it up, and um, let's get final thoughts. Let's go Drew, Max, Adam, and then I'll go. Like I said, I, I, I don't think that this is Raimi's best movie. I don't, certainly don't think it's the best out of the three. I do enjoy it. Uh, I probably actually will go back and watch it more frequently now. I mean, it'll be interesting to see if I react differently the next time I watch it. Um, but it's, it's a fun movie. It's, it's, it's definitely the most uh, outright a Bruce Campbell vehicle of a lot of them like i i, I think uh a lot of bruce bruce campbell's uh beloved fans that came up in the 90s probably found him in this and and went on to watch him in xena and and you know briscoe county jr and whatnot but uh this is uh it's a fun flick I, it was fun watching it and it was fun debating it with with a lot of you guys i i, I enjoyed the back and forth tonight greatly Cool. Yeah, Max. Uh, stand by my, you know, original assessment. Yeah, I had a lot of fun tonight talking about this too. This is probably my favorite show that we've done so far, just because our opinions were so adverse. Um, and it, you know, it, it, was, it was a challenging talk talking to people who are fellow fans of horror films too. Some like it, some don't. Um, I happen to be one of those guys that I, you know, even beyond beyond the commercialness of it, beyond beyond a lot of that stuff, you know, I, I just feel like even if even as a commercial film, I just feel like the 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 plot and other things could have been handled better. I think it I think it just could have been a better film from a story point of view. That's I think that's that's mainly my my, my main query. I think it could have gone on to be something even more, you know, tame, um, even more tempered. I just I just wish that, that a little bit more thought had been put into the actual story that we got. I'll go with that. Adam? Yeah. Uh, you know, I I also agree. This is this is we sort of hotly debated this, which I think is unusual for us because I think we tend to sort of like a lot of the same things. But as I said so many times before, you know, what's awesome is, you know, you really should get to like what you like for for whatever that for whatever that is. You know, and I, I think this is the uh, one of those pictures. Um, I I like the first two very much. Uh, the second one in particular, uh, and this one uh, I like for entirely different reasons. And kind of despite its flaws, I think I think I, I don't want to go so far as to say that it's a celebration. Cause I don't think that's accurate, but it seems like a weird 
drunken joy ride uh, of like Rainy and like Campbell Miss. And you go, I don't know where it's going to go. It may end up, you know, crash at the bottom of a gorge, but it's going to be quite a ride, you know. And there are definitely issues with it. Uh, but, you know, I sort of like it, warts and all. Um, and, you know, I could imagine that it would, you know, I would like to have had something that would have really continued along the same vector that, that Evil Dead 2 was. But, you know, this was a bit different. And, you know, I think um, it's been... I, you know, some people can look at it and and um, through the eyes of like when they saw it the first time, like some sort of a uh, having as a touchstone of their youth or you know however they saw it the first time. But in just looking at it, you know, plainly in, in recently, um, I think there are a lot of qualities to it, and I, and I think that you know I find that if I take away sort of my expectations, if I reduce those down. It was a very enjoyable picture, and again, even though I think it it failed to, in my mind, continue forward from Evil Dead 2, it succeeded for, I think, what it set out to be, um, which was to really make this kind of movie, the first two would not have been, would not have had mass market appeal, but I, I think that this one took that same franchise and and molded it into something that you know, really appealed to a broader audience and really introduced them to, to the franchise, and which is why I think, you know, we still have Ash, you know, figures. We still have, sure. you know, I think all of that really comes, the majority of it, I believe, comes, and, and I think you said it earlier, you see them at conventions. This is the picture that I drag the entire franchise up into the mainstream marketplace and actually, you know, create an appetite, a wider appetite for arguably better movies, you know, arguably, you know, more, um, more concentrated, more pure forms of what Evil Dead, what the DNA of Evil Dead was, like an Evil Dead 2. But this, you know, because of it, it's, this is pretty, pretty awesome. Yeah, I'll go with you there. I mean, I, I, I think that's, that's fair. Um, like I said, I was much more of a fan, I think, with nostalgic goggles on than I was this time viewing it. I think it, you know, was kind of necessary in some ways to make it more mainstream. Like, this is the movie that definitely, like you were saying, pulls it into that. Um, you know, and there's a lot of great bits that this time around didn't gel as much for me. Um, you know, who knows, when I watch it next time, maybe the stars will be aligned and I'll like it more than I did this time around. But um, it definitely is, you know, what got more people to going, oh, man, that Bruce Campbell guy, you know, or that that same Raimi, wow. And like I said before, like watching this, I was also like, okay, I get why Bruce Campbell is Elvis, you know, (laughs) again. I mean, it just worked. Like, so I didn't love it this time around, but I definitely am not like, it's not a wash for me. Um, Just, I don't know. So that brings us to... Uh, endorsements. So um, I guess we'll go in the same order. Drew, go first, I guess. Okie dokie. Uh, well, uh, I'm, I'm going to do, this isn't actually my endorsement, but I want to do a quick follow-up. Uh, I was sick for most of the last week, so I was alone with Netflix because my wife was out of town. And I powered through all two seasons of Hemlock Grove. Uh, never I, I believe I finally discovered what having a guilty pleasure is because I've always said guilt is for chumps. So <laughs> I felt so – I have a pretty high tolerance for trashy TV, but I felt so stupid watching this show. And, you know, I, I, I've said it before multiple times on this podcast. I kind of hate Eli Roth. I think he's I, – I just don't like him. I think, like, his <laughs> style, it just it really rubs me the wrong way. And this still has a lot of good things about it, but it just can't escape its inherent Eli Rothness, which I think is where the where the guilt starts to come in. <laughs> You'll never but, watch this town again, Drew. <laughs> yeah, yeah, Eli Roth is going to come after me. He's going to go after me with a baseball bat like Inglorious Bastards. Uh, but uh, the 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 good thing that I came across this week actually was recommended to me by Tony. 
which is the, the Ross Campbell issues of Glory, which is Rob Liefeld's uh, Wonder Woman ripoff. And uh, they're really, really gorgeous. They're just gorgeous to look at. And uh, you can get a, the first uh, three issues. Uh, actually, the whole series is on Comixology, and it's ninety nine an issue. And I know I'm always talking about Comixology on here, but here's another excuse to go check out Comixology because – Doing, you know, looking at this series through guided view, it's just a beautiful comic. And if you're, you know, a superhero fan or, you know, a DC Comics fan, I think you will like this, like, slightly altered take on the Wonder Woman mythology. But what is most interesting about it is that Campbell draws the, the lead character not as the sort of generic uh comic book woman with a very small build he draws her actually looking like a female bodybuilder which i know is probably controversial with a lot of fanboy types but uh i think it's great because we need more like diversity as far as the way comic book characters look so uh big thumbs up on that too uh so those are my those are my two endorsements one being a sort of half-hearted endorsement of him like grove again <laughs> <laughs> Cool. Matt? Uh, first, before I start, I'm, I wanted to touch on uh, the uh, the quote-along thing. Uh, Tony just sent a link to us uh, about uh, the Army of Darkness quote-along uh, at Alamo Draft House at the Ritz. Uh, and it says every Thursday at 7. Is that right? I think that was really? previously. I think that's older. I don't think I know they do one of... I, uh, I know they do the Big Lebowski quite frequently, but I didn't... Hmm. Well, it, it I was probably all open for that. Yeah, I just I, I will I will at least say that like you asked and you said it would have been you know foolish of them not to do, but it looks like it was a regular thing at least at some point uh, at the Alamo Ritz uh, here in Austin. Uh, yeah. As as for my recommendation, um, I saw a film on Netflix uh, a few weeks ago that uh, I haven't really been able to stop thinking about. Um, and at, at first I, I kind of saw it and I kind of liked it. And as I've, I've thought about it, it's, it's it's really grown on me tremendously. And it's a film from 2013 called Jug Face by a guy by the name of uh, Chad Crawford Kinkle, starring Lauren Ashley Carter, who's kind of a diminutive female actress. And um, what's, what's really funny is that I don't, I typically have an aversion toward horror films that do like, the rednecky kind of like backwoodsy antagonist kind of kind of thing, you know, where they where they, you know, I just I don't like that subgenre. But this uh, this this film takes place uh, in 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 kind of a backwoodsy community of people who you know eat roadkill and and, and brew moonshine, uh, and somehow it manages not to just alienate me completely. Um, if you can get through the first few minutes and you really allow the mythology that it intends to introduce, it, just like get into your, your, your head, it, it actually becomes quite likable. And in a lot of ways, I, I know that we touched upon, we had touched upon this a, a few weeks ago. We talked about uh, some of us like Pumpkinhead and some of us don't like it. Um, I, I think Pumpkinhead has some, it has a few kernels, kernels that are great, but it doesn't quite, you know, let, let them grow into what they could be. Um, as I've thought about Jug Face, I've thought a lot about how this is the film that Pumpkinhead could have been in terms of having like a really great mythology and letting it really kind of run wild. Um, but it's, it's a great film. It's low budget. I am an ardent hater of CGI and computer effects. It has some of that and it, it kind of dampened it a little bit for me, but the film is still really good overall. And Ashley's uh, uh, performance is, is the lead female actress and it, her, her performance is phenomenal. And I recommend that everybody check it out. Awesome. Cool. Adam? Uh, I don't think I have any real endorsements this week. I was um, under the category of guilty pleasures. Uh, I was sort of, I fell into a screening of uh, 23, 23 Jump Street. Uh, 23, I got to tell you, I was actually amused by it. <laughs> it was like a weird guilty pleasure. Somehow the chemistry between the two guys worked. I don't know. I was highly entertained by it. It is not at all the genres that we're talking about, but 
you know, I thought that, like, that movie was fun. In a, I really yeah. love the first one. So like, I like yeah, the first one. I, I thought it was fun, man. I I didn't expect it because usually like, ho ho, we're gonna turn this into a parody. That can go really wrong. But yeah. I, I actually had fun with that movie as well. You know, okay. and I think well, the, the closing credits really, really, really. And, yeah. and I went back. I, I I skipped the first movie, um, but after seeing, you know, I guess Twenty Three Jump Street, I I went back and. I, got, I watched the first one again, and and that was funny too. I was like, okay, that that seems to it. I I can't imagine how they're gonna continue on. Although I feel like they're gonna have to, but um, maybe what they'll do is they'll take them and they'll put them in the far far past, surrounded by undead deadites, and I think it'll work. No, <laughs> <laughs> army of Jump Street. Nice. Yeah. Nice. Or, you know, um, I didn't really have one, but now that Drew kind of mentioned it, I think you should also uh, check out, if you can find a copy, uh, Ross Campbell's The Abandoned, which does some really great stuff with zombies and has some really awesome character moments as well as kind of his style, which he draws. I was drawn to it by the fact that, you know, his characters look like, people you would see around like you know they're not super wafy you know there's a, a broad range of characters it's a really great zombie take and it's kind of a shame that it didn't get it to do and that you know it didn't do well enough for Tokyo Pop to really pick it up and push it more um I I think I uh, reviewed it when I was doing my calling manga island column and I think Ross Campbell really has a lot going on it's different than a lot of other people um, in in comics, um, he also you know does a great take on turtles in my opinion. Uh, but I really wait think wait wait. He did, this show, like, he did he did turtle he did the yeah he did some turtle Venus. stories. Yeah, look it up. Uh, uh, he's, now he's I got a lot of stuff. That. Yeah, and I really I'm just kind of discovering. Like, yeah, he's a he's he's done some really great stuff, and I think you know in going along with this show, I think his zombie tale, the abandoned, um, really should have gotten more press. Uh, I think it was one of the better... It, it really stuck with me as one of the better Tokyo Pop books at the time. Um, and, you know, no offense to any other creators, but it was just... It really, really hit on a lot of stuff that I dug. And I, I wish that it would have continued, at least to the kind of normal... You know, most books got three... Uh, you know, they got three volumes. Um, a lot of them got cut to two, and Unfortunately, his and Becky Cloonan's uh, East Coast Rising, which only got one, and that's a real shame, too, because that book was looking like it was going to do some amazing things, and Becky Cloonan's really, really great as well. But um, I think, yeah, check out Ross Campbell's Abandon. That's my take. Um, anyway, next week we'll be covering the Evil Dead remake, so I hope you'll stick around with us for that. Uh, same crew, and I think after that, Jason will be back with us. But we've it's been really great having uh, Adam and Max on this journey. It's been really, really cool. So we'll great. get back with you uh, next week. So everybody say goodbye, and we'll see you next Wednesday. Bye. 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 Awesome. Take it easy.